So welcome to the next session in our CIAI colloquium series. And today we are, it's our honor to have uh, Associate Professor C. Chen from the Stern School of Business, New York University. And he's also an affiliated professor for computer science and the Center for Data Science at New York University. Uh, so a little bit about C's history. Uh, he was a postdoc in Professor Michael Jordan's group at UC Berkeley. And he also obtained his PhD from the machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, in fact, I believe C and I roughly, we were maybe overlap one or two, 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 three overlap years. About two, three years. So I knew C during our time, both as uh, PhD students. Great. So uh, uh, C works in the area of high dimensional machine learning, uh, online learning and large scale stochastic optimization with applications to operations management at FinTech. And recently he's starting a new research line on blockchain technology and decentralized uh, finance. He is a recipient of the COPSS Leadership Academy, NSF Career Award, and he's also an elected member of the International Statistical Institute, right? Um, some other fun awards. He's also the world's best 40 under 40 MBA professor by Poets and Quants and Forbes 30 under 30 uh, in science. So please welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Si Chen, uh, Professor Si Chen, yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. It's my great time uh, to be here. You know, it's a great honor to talk here, and it's very my very first time being uh, in the in Abu Dhabi. But actually, it's you know like back to going to MVZ UAI. It's pretty much like going back to home. It's uh, all like you know Eric Shin was uh, he taught me machine learning class back in 2007 at that time. So 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 and and we'll see like the witness the whole like the growing of the machine learning since. So I'm going to talk about something like two different topics. One is on digital privacy and personalized pricing. <clears throat> and the other is on some new research in Web3, depending on the time. Um, and the first work is joint work with MIT professor David Singh Chidabevi and also another CMU alumni, Yin Yin Wang. He's now a professor at UT Dallas. Um, so I certainly pricing is the most important business kind of e-commerce from Amazon, Alibaba, Orbis, and, and Uber. They all like do a lot of pricing. Uh, but believe it or not, you know, people do personalized pricing in all kinds of ways. Uh, for example, there's cover business review saying that I thought, uh, realizing that my package on the laptop, the identical flights, room, hotel type, was 6.5% more on the price on the app. So it's kind of a, we usually call it price discrimination. And, uh, and Uber indeed used the personalized pricing to offer premium pricing to predict which users are willing to pay more to go to a certain location. I see many like students here, like if you, you know, like there's an app called DD in China, uh, you know, for quite a bit of time, you use the Apple and Android phone, they charge you different prices. And if you think about this, you may think, okay, it's a bad thing, but actually the company can do it in a much more secretive way, which means that they give you different levels of coupon or discount. You can still charge you the same price, but different level of coupon to make the personalized price. So indeed, like personalized data have been heavily evolving data-driven decision-making, and the, they are very sensitive, they are private. Examples include age, gender, purchase history, and more like serious one, like medical history, credit information, you know, like all the private information. So uh, as this is going on, the privacy breaches of personalized data indeed have very serious ethical and legal consequences. And Microsoft, Google, Apple, US, like Census Bureau, all like devote now a huge amount of money and efforts into like the how to address like the privacy issue in terms of like their business. So today I'm going to zoom in uh, in a very particular pricing problem with just the call it dynamic pricing, uh, which means is that uh, the, the, we're trying to address two questions in today's talk. The first one is how to incorporate personalized data into dynamic pricing with the objective of maximize the revenue and profit. And second is that how to avoid leaking private personalized data of their users. The first one was using some online bandits learning a framework, but were twisted for the privacy concern. And second was using something called differential privacy. And the goal of today's talk is to show you a new method for private preserving personalized dynamic pricing. Okay. So please don't have any questions. Okay. So let's take a look at the, like, the very basic setting of dynamic pricing. Uh, you can certainly extend it to like many much more richer setting, but for the talk, I just consider it's very simple setting where the rater is just a sell a single product without any inventory constraints. 
And so basically we're assuming like this. So there are T customer arriving sequentially, okay? T customer arriving one, one by one. And if you are the retailer or like e-commerce platform, for each arriving customer, you first observe this XT, which is the contextual vector of the like arriving customer. For example, you know, like the personal information, personal history, their social network, is all condensing this what we call contextual vector. Uh, needless to say, this contextual vector should be like sensitive information. And the retailer sees this vector of the customer. The next step is that retailer needs to make a price decision, we call it PT. And then the, the customer will see the price PT and they will realize the demand called YT, okay? According to some demand model we'll show in the next slide. But you can see in the simplest way is YT is just a whether you buy it or not buy it. This can be a logistical regression function in terms of XT and PT. And or it, it can represent how many quantities you're going to buy if you are, you are, if you are going to buy a lot. You know, YT can be a linear model. So basic idea is as follows. The customer arrives with the sensitive information X1. The retailer decides the price P1. And uh, the outcome is Y1. You customer buy it or not. And then the next customer comes in with X2. And the retailer will just uh, incorporate what he have learned from before and, and give a new price like P2 and observe the purchase outcome Y2, so on and so forth. Okay. So it's just a very simple process. Any questions for this? Well, I have a question. Yeah. Is it necessary <laughs> that um, it's sequential or does it matter like which time it arrives? Because- oh, We're just assuming a whole mode. We do, we're just assuming like the, they just the uh, customers arrives one by one. Of course, you can see that a, a bunch of customers arrive at the same time, but you can always, you know, like make sure you know, sure the time is, the time grade is fine enough so that you just, so there's XT uh, can, can, be, uh, can be arbitrary. Although we do not assume the XT are ID, they can be anniversary. So, and, so they can be any contextual vector. So, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, we're just assuming a very simple generalized linear demand model. You can inject the, whatever neural network model you want. So we're basically assuming like YT is your purchase selected decision based on PT and XT is just a function of F and the fee is a feature mapping to map the price and also contextual information into a single feature. And theta star is the underlying true model parameter. Okay, so it's a very general framework, but we we'll assume it's a generalized linear model uh, for theoretical de uh, de development. Okay, so fee is a feature map of price and contextual. Okay? And theta star is the true parameter is unknown. And then the question that first I'll tell you like how to address this problem without any privacy concern, and then we'll move to the world of the, the, the privacy. Okay. So without any privacy concern, the people consider this learning while doing a framework. They just learn the model of true, true parameters, C, theta star, while they are trying to offer you to optimize the price. Okay. The idea is very simple. And so at time t from one to t, uh, the retailer are always making an estimate uh, of the theta, the theta star at time t. You can by maximum likelihood estimate or you train whatever machine learning model, you get an estimate. But what is interesting that the, now the next customer comes in with the XT, you need to offer a price. Okay? So surprisingly, you, you, well, you know, people show that if you're trying to see the price P, just the times the, the current, your belief of current demand function. So this is the price, this is the demand, right? So their product is kind of a rev, the revenue, for example, this is the price, this is the how, much, how many quantities you're going to buy. So together it's kind of the, the profit you, you, you make or the revenue you, you, you make. And if you only optimize this two, you will not be able to work. This method will not work because your theta hat is not the true same theta star. This theta hat is your estimate and your that estimate can be very inaccurate. So very fundamental thing like in all the like online learning, bandits, reinforcement learning, is a, the beauty is the second term is that you need to add one term, which is phi, phi, and a gamma transpose, uh, the gamma inverse, which is covariance matrix, we'll talk about a little bit later. But basically you need to add one term. So which means that this is the current estimate of the demand, but the current estimate may be inaccurate. So we want to make a little bit of adjustment. And our adjustment is called, it's called optimism in face of uncertainty, which means that you add like a little bit buffer and you add towards the, the optimistic way, in the sense that, you know, this is your current estimate, this is more like confidence band, but you're adding the upper part, which means you're all more optimistic about the outcome of the demand. 
and you are trying to find the price which maximizes this guy. And, and of course, you will think like this fee, just I want to mention this, this optimization in the fee feature vector is also dependent on your price peak. Okay, and you, 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 you offer this price and you observe whether the customer buys or not by the Y key and you update your model parameter by whatever machine learning algorithm you like. Okay, so this is the algorithm. Uh, I will skip the related literature due to time constraint. Uh, but but the, now we're mainly focused on the privacy concern. So the customer profile XT contains a lot of like sensitive information. Uh, first of all, the customer purchase decision is very sensitive. Because if you know like whether a customer purchased a certain drug, you pretty much know what kind of disease he or she will have. And second, the XT, the feature vector is a private information as we mentioned. So give you a little bit background, you know, like even the selling platform, like, like say Alibaba or Amazon, they do not release any XT and YT. There are people at adversary, you know, like the, the bad guy, still have the way to infer the sensitive data from the posted price. Sounds a little bit magic. If I don't release XT and YT by the company, how they can infer this price, okay? How they can infer sensitive data? I'll give you like two very basic illustrations. The first is that how, you know, if you are adversary, how do you design a mechanism trying to infer their purchase decision YT? So, you know, like from the previous algorithm, you can show you that if the people see you, you give a price, people buy it. You give a second price, people buy it. You give another price, people buy it. So what you should do? You should increase the price. So you should charge more. So then, you know, the idea is very simple. You can inject the order and another order, inject the two orders. You know, before and after the order, you are really interested. For example, this is a very big, important person, some government officials, you really want to understand this. So you just uh, put two others, you know, before and after. And then it's very interesting, you know, like if you see the price increase a lot, you probably understand, okay, you know, like just a lot, like the problem is more likely the person of interest to just to make the purchase. And so of course, it's just to increase your belief or likelihood. But this gives you an idea, you know, how this become possible. And then you think a little bit more harder question. How do you see, how do you infer like personal information XT? That's a feature vector. So for example, you know, like the, the most fundamental assumption that you know the algorithm will offer similar prices if they see similar XT. Two customers, your profile are very close there. You're all like male and you know, between 25, 35 years old. They're all like, for example, have similar personal behavior. The, the agents will, you know, the, the, the platform will offer you a similar price. So idea is very simple. Same, same for you. If you already make a guess of the XT, you know, like, of people of interest, you want to seek their secret, but you don't. You are not sure whether your 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 guess is accurate. The way you did that is you inject the order and and then the order before and after the customer of interest. And so what you see that if you see the price before and after are the same, so you, you already guess it, and you see the price doesn't change, so it's pretty much tell you your guess is correct. So you can using this idea to just do this kind of privacy. Injection, you know, like even you don't have the the platform is kind of secure, but you can still infer the information from that. So, so from that, you know, the people say, okay, how to quantify the privacy? So, to avoid the privacy leakage, the key idea is to add in noise. You know, usually people add either Gaussian noise or flashing noise to the data or learn the parameters. And then the question is, how much amount of noise? As you can see, if your noise is too small, you really cannot protect the privacy. But if your noise is too large, you, you, you destroy your data. You, know, you add a too large, so the noise is, can be quantified by, for example, the Gaussian variance. If you add a Gaussian with the infinite variance, it's just a destroy all your data. Then you will incur, like you will have a significant revenue loss. So the differential privacy was proposed by Professor Cynthia Duarte and now at Harvard University. It's a mathematical rigorous way to quantify the privacy leakage. Okay, so I give you a one line of definition. Um, I try to make the math to be small as possible for the talk, but I still need to talk a little bit. I give you a one line definition of differential privacy. It's saying that for any two neighboring data set D and D prime, with only one data difference, okay, so with only one XT and YT difference, a randomized policy, so pi is kind of a, given the data, I give you the sequence of the price. Is epsilon delta differential privacy, if by any measurable set, so 
So we can just view as outcome. The probability of given the data D, your price outcome is, can be bounded by e to the power of epsilon. The probability of, you know, if you put your pricing policy on another data set D prime, and the probability of this within certain pricing set, the price set plus delta. So let's look at this equation more carefully. If the epsilon and delta is zero, this will become equal, you know, like kind of means this will become one. So if this is zero, this will be one, and this is zero, it's just a, a disappear. This means that for any two data set, one data point difference, their probability will be the same. So it's, it's the highest stringent of privacy, but it's almost a no use because you change one data point, the price doesn't change. You change another data point, price doesn't change. But on the other hand, if epsilon and delta are large, your privacy becomes more relaxed. So delta and epsilon become smaller, your privacy is better, and delta epsilon becomes larger, the privacy is good. And you know, like, so the basic idea is that if you have two data, you have your, like two data sets, you change like one data point, and you're fitting to a randomized algorithm, generate answers, and the adversary look at two set of answers, they cannot tell it's generated from this data set or that data set. But this parameter is very important, you know, like, a, um, I think quite a few years ago, you know, when the company, when the Apple, I think I believe it's Apple or some other company, they think that they are doing the privacy, uh, but actually they use Epsilon to be a super large number. And so they, they tell, for example, you know, I, I don't know which, com which, which company, but some company, you know, like say, okay, I may use differential privacy to protect customer, but I use Epsilon to be very large. So, you know, like, so you should bear in mind, actually that not, the privacy is quite relaxed. The idea is like here is very it's simple that you know like it's given us previous example it means that adversary seeing the price pt minus one and the pt they really cannot tell whether the data of interest is coming from xt yt or another one from xt prime yt prime this is the, the idea of differential privacy so far so good questions okay so uh, to address this question we need to uh, solve some technical challenges. Uh, the first one is that, you know, generalize the linear model, uh, do not admit sufficient statistics like, you know, like linear models. For linear model, I only need, I say X transpose X and X transpose Y to quantify this, but generalized linear model becomes much more complicated. If you have a machine learning model, it's even much, it's even complicated. So we, we try to protect the privacy. We use something called the privacy aware maximum likelihood estimation is uh, coming from a, a paper from Kiefer uh, 2012, and it's just called private MLE. So the idea is very simple. You just do whatever machine learning algorithm you have. So you add one more term. You subtract the W transpose theta, and W is the noise with the mean zero and standard deviation mu. And this standard deviation is, depends on your epsilon and delta. So epsilon and delta is your differential privacy parameter. If your epsilon and delta is smaller, which means you have more stringent privacy, your new will be large. So it's very simple, and you can replace this part by any machine learning algorithm you like. Okay, so this is a one part, which is adding this kind of noise. And second is that, you know, like, if you update your model, if you update your parameter every iteration after every customer, uh, I cannot go into detail proof here, but it, you actually you will show that, you can show that you are leaking too much information, you know, like, because you update every time, the people can track how you know, like your app, your pr parameter change can give you a leak a lot of information. So that will use something called the infrequent private model app updates. So basically we are keep a private version of the sample covariance, like we call it la like lambda t. And we only recompute our parameter, private MLE. You retrain your machine learning model when the determinant of this guy doubles. So you know, this characterizes the information about the data. And this means if the determinant of this guy doubles, means your data has accumulated a lot, then it tells you like you should re-update your machine learning parameters, your learning parameters. So the algorithm is actually it's a very simple. It's just like, I, so I, I use them, instead of giving lines of codes, I'm just using a picture. So there's O1 to OT, each O is just XT and YT is your sensitive data. So at each time n, you first uh, compute your lambda is covariance matrix, from a covariant, private covariance update. It's, I won't go into detail. You just uh, can't think that you are just computing X transpose X, but you perturb adding a little bit noise. And 
you adopted this private covariance. And you'll check if your determinant of your covariance is bigger than the two times the determinant of a previously stored covariance. It's maybe from a few steps ago. The two answers to actually, if this check is yes, then you recompute your parameter theta hat from the private MLE. And you, you use your current covariance matrix you put into the a buffer to store like, you know, like the, the next step in like covariance matrix. Otherwise, you don't do any change. You still use the previously computed theta hat and also the lambda p. And no matter if you yes or no, you have your estimated parameter theta hat, they may be updated from the private MLE. They may not be updated. Then we're still using the previous algorithm I showed to you, which is trying to maximize the P. This is an expected demand function, and this is a confidence interval. CI is the confidence interval. And you're trying to maximize, choosing a P, trying to maximize this, this thing. Okay, this is an optimistic estimate of your revenue, because this is a demand, and this is a confidence interval. This is an optimistic estimate of your revenue. And you repeat this process. Very simple algorithm, you know, kind of implement it like in, in maybe, a, you know, like two lines of, you know, like you know, 10 lines of code for the skeleton, but of course you need to inject your fancy machine learning algorithm for the private MLE. But, but any question for this one? So how do you uh, determine the parameter, the epsilon and the, the theta? Oh yeah, uh, epsilon and delta, that's, that's interesting. So it's very, very good question. So basically, algorithm need the input of epsilon and delta, and epsilon and delta impacts, for example, to your variance. How to determine epsilon and delta is pretty much like a, it's not, it's not tuning, it's not cross-validation. It's more like it depends on your business need. So the, uh, the, the, in practice, what people did as follows. Okay, they, they just tune like it's epsilon and delta. Uh, if, if from, let's say, from a pretty small epsilon and delta, you will observe like a pretty, you know, like a deteriorate, you know, bad performance of the machine learning algorithm because you inject too much noise. And you can increase the epsilon and delta a little bit, a little bit until, until on a certain point, okay, you're satisfied with the performance and your privacy is kind of a protected. It's more like a trade-off. Epsilon and delta becomes bigger. I guarantee you like you'll get better performance, but less privacy. Epsilon and delta is smaller. I, you will get better privacy, but certainly worse performance. It's more like your business choice. And it will provide some theoretical bond to give you a little bit guidance, but in practice, you still have to make your own choice, you know, like uh, by, 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 by choosing the parameter. Other questions? Can you repeat again why you do not update the parameter? Oh, yes. Step? The idea is that if you, if you update the parameter theta every time, yes. then, you know, adversary can see your theta is kind of a, can see the, can give a track of the updated parameter. So it's just a list the information, it leaks the privacy information. So it's during the training process. Exactly. So there's a serum called curse of, curse of composition in the differential privacy literature. It's, I just feel too deep going to that. But if you're interested, you can search for curse of composition, <coughs> differential privacy, and there's a whole book on that, you know, tell you if you do this kind of thing, you will leak too much information. Okay. Oh, one last question. The, um, the determinant is, is only when that is doubled. Is yeah. that a parameter as well? Like uh, setting double? Yeah, you can see it's three, you can put four. Um, you can kind of choose, but you know, like, we, we feel like double is simple enough and good enough. Because if the attacker knows like it's gonna cause the determinant to double. Oh, no, no, it's uh, attacker even no double is not an error. It's just a means that you cannot update every time. You you have to update once a while. You, you know, like you it's just theoretically we can prove that we can release all this algorithm to the attacker. It doesn't it doesn't matter. Okay, uh, so of course we need to prove some results as a serious machine learning scientists, right? So we, we need to show like our algorithm has certain guarantee. So so how do we measure our algorithm? Okay, we, we measure it by something called a regret. Okay, and the regret is very simple. So this is the, the P star is the optimal price for maximize the revenue. If I know the true expectation, okay, if I know, know the true expectation, I can find the optimal price. And even without any privacy concern. So this is a very strong, very strong upper bound. You know, like it, it means that the optimal price for the procedure without any privacy concern, okay. And this PT is the algorithm by our privacy-preserving algorithm. 
And you will first ask the question in a traditional way without privacy concern, how much this one can, you know, how large the gap, the gap is. We can only be larger, but cannot be shorter because we have another layer of privacy concern. And people already prove like, you know, like for this guy, without any privacy concern, it's the gap is around the D square root of T. D is the dimensionality of your feature X and T is the num number of time periods or the number of customers. Okay, so then the question is how the regret looks like for the proposal policy subject to the absolute delta privacy constraint. Okay, okay so is any question on this regret? I think some students may first see it for the first time, but- uh, So I have one question. It's not about the technical proof itself, but rather uh, how willing are businesses uh, uh, to, because you know, privacy is a trade-off for business, right? It's not their primary business interest to preserve privacy. It's usually something to regulate Good. them to do. Good. So in practice, if a business is required to, to preserve privacy, what is the amount of regret that they're willing to tolerate in practice? Uh, very good question. I don't know. I, I can tell you some legal cases I see, you know, they, they try to give a, they try to present this differential privacy framework to the, to the, to the lawyer. And, you know, like, especially in the Europe, I think Google, Apple, all this company is suffering from that. You know, the, Euro, yes, yes, Euro, right. the, 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 the Euro, European legal institution is very, very strict. Okay. They say you, you have to do this. Okay. They say, okay, let's hire a big team trying to do this. Um, you know, and then, uh, then they present something to the, uh, to the, to the lawyer, to, to, the, to the judge, okay? And you say, okay, we do this privacy concern. Um, lawyer say, fine, I don't understand differential privacy. I don't know how much privacy you, 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 you protect it. But we, this is privacy concern. We already lost uh, $10 million. And then the lawyer say, okay, $10 million is not bad. Do better privacy. Okay, and then you, you run some report saying that if we do this, this kind of privacy, we'll lost $50 million. Mm, that, that's pretty very interesting. So, you know, like it turns out, I think, you know, surprisingly for those companies, they have very little incentive to do this differential privacy. They just want to get all the customer data and trying to leverage as much as possible to, to, to you know, like to, 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 you know, like this thing. But, but that's the reason why later on we'll talk about Web3, you know, like kind of the, the data that actually, you know, like believe it or not, I have some statistics talking to the business students, like, you know, in Korean, from 16 to 64, 16 to 64 years old are people, on average, how much time they spend on the internet? Okay. One and two hours, very close, 10.7. Per day, so per week? Per day, per day, you are on the internet, from 16 to 64 years old. You believe most of them are not programming, are not reading papers, are not <laughs> writing papers. That's all, all you guys doing here. They are contributing their data to all this Facebook, TikTok, Amazon, you know, Uber, all these companies, Twitter, right? So you, you, again, companies. And I ask another question. You, you, can, can you guess how much time, there are how many people in the US, for example, spend more than eight hours per day on game? Eight hours, that's a full-time job, right? So I'm a full-time job. 13 million people. There are 30 million people work for free. For the gaming company, it's maybe this gaming company, maybe that gaming company, but anyway, for a gaming company. So you know, like all these people pro pro generate all this data to, to, to the company, like that's, that's crazy. That's, uh, that's you know, more ever, you know, everyone here like spent significant kind of time working for this company for that data. So, so, so certainly privacy is very, very important. Uh, okay, so, so then we'll talk about, finish the story that you know, what is the privacy look like if you have the privacy concept? So subject to absolute delta differential privacy, we prove a bond. It may not be, it's, we don't know whether it's high, high or not, but, but it's showing the correct phenomenon is one wraps from this cube T log five, log, log term, we can just ignore this. Okay? <laughs> so if you compare these two terms, okay? Uh, interesting that we, D part is not sharp, okay? It's, this is D squared. If you put it in the square root, but this DQ is not sharp. But the ab ab epsilon part is, it, it should be correct because one over epsilon, it means that if your epsilon is smaller, means you have a stringent privacy concern. You are suffering a more like revenue loss, like more regret. Um, so I have a question. Could you go back one slide to the oh. definition of the regret bound, yes. right? So it is measured as the difference between the, the optimal uh, 
price, price which is actually price. intuitively is the price that the, the maximum price the buyer would be willing to pay, right? Exactly. So therefore, the interpretation here, okay, so if the, the price offer you make, if it's higher, the buyer will not have bought and you lose that entire sale. If it's lower, you lose the difference exactly. between uh, P star and P, exactly. right? Exactly. So either way, you lose something, yeah. but it's actually more costly to overprice yeah. because you completely lose the deal, yeah. right? So is there any consideration made for the fact that it's asymmetric in this sense that going higher is yes. maybe riskier than going lower? Uh, I think, you know, like it's, should be quantified in the algorithm when you're trying to say the optimistic, the online bandit is optimistic, you do the UCB bound for the upper part, I not see. for the lower part. Mm, okay. So UCB part is also not symmetric. So, so, okay, so the so, bound is not symmetric. Yeah, so you are, you are trying to you are trying to add the confidence interval. Mm. You say why you not subtract, right? So it's all not asymmetric neither. So 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 this part actually in you implicitly take this one. Got the algorithm designed to be uh, either optimistic or conservative, exactly. depending which way you look at. Yeah, exactly. So okay. Uh, so can we do better? Um, one thing that we can do better if we made stronger assumptions. So uh, so if X T, we assume the customer contextual information is ID, it's the same distribution independent. We can improve this bound to D square root of T. So in terms of T, it's just a matrix the optimal bound and some other term one over epsilon square D square. Yeah, so it's uh, it's matching the, the, the this d square t in the dominating term, and still this one reflects if your epsilon is smaller, you you suffer a like larger regret. Um, this uh, depends on whether you are interested in theory, but at least we show something. They are they are, they are, they are they're trying to quantify the trade off, <clears throat> and we just uh, do like very small example. There's many other, many other experiments in the paper. Uh, so the one thing is like that. Averaging regret. So, so basically, this idea shows this is a number of time periods. This is a re re regret, and this epsilon. Okay, so it's, you can say, first of all, for all different epsilon, your t grows, your average regret is one over t uh, of the re regret. It's all, de all decreased because this should be like one over, like whether it's, uh, so it's uh, uh, I, it's, you know, like because the square root of t, if it's one over t. Uh, this will be like one over square root of t, right? So it's with t increases, your regret, average regret, uh, should be de should be decreased. Switch the system to whiteboard as well. So uh, it's okay. I just finished. Right? Okay. Just no, 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 no worry. Sure. I just write a very simple thing. So, so they are decreasing. Okay. And and this is epsilon is zero point zero two, and this is epsilon is zero point two. As you can see, epsilon is growing from the small to the large, so that your your epsilon will become larger. You have less stringent. Privacy constraint, so your 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 regret is different. Yeah? Your regret becomes smaller, and this is the case for the DS three. Yeah, they are similar. Okay, so um, uh, another final note I want to make is that uh, in the privacy we have like people devising the true privacy. Uh, what we talked before is called a, uh, it, 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 it's called centralized or global privacy, and the other is called a local privacy. Okay, so what does it mean? So so actually, you know, like you previously we make assumption. This assumption is the retailer. Okay, the retailer will not do bad things. You don't expect Amazon to sell their data, right? You or Alibaba or whatever e-commerce platform sell their data. But uh, but the, the local privacy mm -hmm. is you know the aggregator or the platform is untrusted. This can be several ways. For example, the company is bad. You know, like for example, I don't know if you see the news a few years ago, like the Facebook. Uh, they cut off some, the third party is not Facebook directly, but third party who, who, who the third party of Facebook, they just uh, leaks their data. But then all like what I'm talking about has been useless because your XTIYT has already been given to the people. So on the other hand, you can, some people say, okay, even the aggregator or the platform is trusted, I can directly hack the, like an internet channel. Okay? So if I can hack the channel, I will still get your information of X and Y. So what should the people do? The people think that, okay, the local privacy means that you should add noise before you send the data. The, the, the data. What kind of raw data, X, T, and Y, T you are sent to the server, you should add the noise. You should send to the AWS, whatever thing, you should add the noise before the data was even sending out. So this is a lot called the local privacy. So we, we, we're still telling the similar story, but you say, okay, in the local privacy, what the, 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 it, it looks like. Anyway, it's publishing OR. Uh, I will not go into details of today because I want to talk about something else. So I conclude my first part is that I'm talking about personalized revenue management, which is becomes increasingly prevalent in the e-business. 
and privacy is a major concern in personalized price revenue management. And I, I, I basically talk about the first paper, and if you're interested, you can look at the second paper. So let's conclude the first part of the talk. But any questions before I move to the second one? Uh, excuse me, I have mm. a question. Mm. Uh, so it is, uh, it might be illegal to use those privacy information of customers. Then is it possible to infer those uh, so-called privacy information uh, through those uncovered information? Is it possible or it is allowed? Uh, certainly it's possible, you know, without privacy consent, you know, like people, I feel like people can do this kind of a thing. This kind of a, right, you can, you can infer people's private information. Yes. Whether it's allowed or not, no one knows. You know, like uh, if, if you do it and make a, and if you do it, make maybe, you know, like a million dollar, probably it's okay. If you make a billion dollar, probably you are in big trouble. So <laughs> I think in, in our domain, we can consider those uncovered information as latent variable, and then we uh, use a kind of algorithm to yeah. infer those required information. Yeah. It's quite possible. The privacy is a very big do do domain. This di even differential privacy have been one of the mostly widely used differential uh, privacy in machine learning. It's still a small chunk of privacy. Privacy is very, very important. It's, it's very general. Okay, um, I'll go into the second part of the talk, uh, which, which is very new research area. Um, I'll throw some open questions for you. And it's, it's, uh, I just call it new research area in Web3. So, so what is Web3? Okay, so I try to make sure that even you don't understand blockchain, you, you, it's a, your first time to hear about Bitcoin, um, you still can understand the talk and try to make this happen. So, so basically, blockchain is the internet powered by blockchain technology owned by builders and end users. And, uh, and it's always, in, mostly it's equipped with tokens and cryptocurrency. Okay? And essentially, blockchain is a distributed database. It's nothing, it's just a distributed database. It's consensus lab, which means that if you update a database, you need other people to jointly approve your change and your change will be communicated with all the parties in the database. It's permission, there's no centralized node in the database and it's immutable. Once you change the database, you cannot say, I get it back. There's no rollback operation in this blockchain. So it's just, a, it's nothing, it's just a distributed database. And but why Web3 is so amazing is that it's, first of all, it has a, Great power in, in, time, in terms of create economy. There's many, many ways, you know, like create economy. Token itself is a way to create the economy. But, but in general, you can think about, you know, we talk about you're all working for the, the data company, but data company never reward you. So, you know, some people think that, okay, let's uh, build a new web browser. If you, if you are, they will ask you whether you are willing to watch the ads and w whether, you know, like you are allowed to keep your cookie. If you say a lot, and they will see the number of cookies they detect per day. And they will see how much business value, advertisement value of this cookie, and they will reward you the money. Right? So it sounds a much more reasonable thing. You're playing the game and uh, your contribution to the game should be get rewarded. So like Roblox, I don't know if anyone used that, like Roblox is the pioneer. They design a token, but the thing at that time, there's no cryptocurrency, there's no blockchain. So their token can only be used by themselves. This cannot be traded, but none of the things can be traded. Uh, second, second, second power of like blockchain that they are building, trying to build community. Of course, you see the NFT, this kind of things, uh, no matter if they're Ponzi or not, then they're building a community among the like, young generation of people. Um, I can go on and on into the blockchain. I can, you know, I taught like two day workshop on the blockchain. I'm writing a book on that, uh, on the web three and how it will impact our economy. Next week, I, I go into the g talking about, you know, like decentralized finance to the, to the institutional banker. But today I'm going to talk a little bit about decentralized finance to you and talk a little bit about my research. So decentralized finance is an emerging financial technology based on the blockchain. Uh, there should be a letter, it's only one sentence. But well, it's really that fast, okay. So I tell you like the most basic thing, how do you trade, how many people trade stocks? Here, before. No one really buy stock? Okay, <laughs> I will be all right to, 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 to study. It's very hard, right? So actually, you know, like you buy the stock, you think you buy the stock at, like say, Apple at $100. Actually, it's not the case. The stock really works in this way. Um, there is something called the ask side, which means the sell side, and the bid side, which means the buy side. You put your order, which means how much money you were willing to sell, 
and this is the how much money you are willing to buy. You know, you, you put your orders here. If you say, okay, I want to, I want to really buy a huge amount of like 1,000 Apple stocks right now, you have to go this side, okay? You have to eat, it's more like you eat the orders. You eat from here to here, and then you eat from here to here. So your price, for example, this is, a fifth, this is 100 bucks, but if you want by one million share of Apple stock, you eat this one, you eat this one, you eat this one, your, your final realized the price for buying is maybe 102. And Apple is, you know, like kind of a liquidity is very good. But if you think about you're buying some penny stock, which means the liquidity is very bad. Actually, you can, you can, you can buy at very high price. Even you see the price currently is maybe 50 bucks. At the end, you can even pay 100 bucks per share to buy. And it's because this whole structure is, we call it a limit on the book structure. This has been in the Wall Street, I think, at least for, for like 50 years and even high, long, longer than that. But if you think about this, implementing this kind of thing on the blockchain is almost impossible because every people need to agree on such a very deep, you know, kind of a thing. So you, once you update one order, has hundreds of thousands of nodes on the blockchain, you need to update it simultaneously. That's just gets very crazy. So people say, okay, we're doing something different. It's called automating the market maker. Uh, I don't know if I can use this one. Can, I can yes, so give me a second. Let's uh, clear the whiteboard. Uh, I believe if we... Is this? Well, that okay. works. And now I just need to have the system present the whiteboard onto... We're ready to go. Okay, that's correct. So the automated market maker is the that's amazing thing. Okay, they, they put a pool, um, you know, just as a pool. And people put two kind of tokens. One is that's called ETH, E0. And the other, let's say, called BUY. DAI is just like a US dollar, okay? It's just like a, we call it stable coin. We'll talk about it stable coin a bit later. They put a pool like this, okay? And X is the number of ETH in the pool, and Y is, ETH is always one token. Y is the other token, is like say the stable coin. And this pool is just a little one thing. Always make sure their product is a constant, okay? So then the price of X actually will be like the reserve, the token of Y over the reserve token of X. I just to give you a concrete example. So at the beginning, let's say you have like 10 of the coin A and 30 of the coin B, and their multiplication is 300. Okay. And now you see, okay, I want to buy, let's say you want to buy, let's say five token A, okay? I want to buy five token A. You, you want to buy? So you, uh, sorry, sorry, I actually say, uh, so I say, okay, you, 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 sorry, I should say you sell like five token A, okay, you, you sell it, you sell it to the pool, which means that your X zero will become 15, right? Your X zero will be 10 plus 15, you, you put, you, you sell like five tokens. Then how many token B you will get? You want just to make sure these two things will be a constant. And the token B initially is 30, and after that, you're trying to make this 300, this will be 20. So you, you sell like five token A, so what you get is you get like 10 token B. This is how people buy and sell tokens on the decentralized world because it's a very simple structure. You know, like everything just uh, maintains straight up numbers, X and Y and the K. And all the nodes just maintain the straight up numbers. They can do all the tradings. It's really amazing. So, so you know, like for example, you can make it a little bit more rigorous. That's it. If you want to like sell Delta X, and, and, what, and what you get, okay? So you can write on the equation, okay, X plus delta X and Y minus delta Y should be K. And you just solve this equation and you get delta Y. Delta Y is the tokens you get if you sell this. And if you want to buy the Y, so what you get is that you get X minus delta and this Y plus delta Y is K. And that's, that's it. So it's just, uh, okay, so far so good. So I'm trying to make sure the math is everybody can understand, okay. And, but the thing that people need to make this pool, okay? You need to make this pool. And how do you make this pool? You need to deposit. If you have Ethereum, you have DAI, you need to make sure you deposit your money in, in, into this pool so people can do the swap. When the people do the swap, you know, buy and sell can be the swap. Actually, it's taking your token. And so you have an incentive to do it. So you put, you know, like, you, you at least, uh, you know, put the liquidity, we call it the liquidity, which means the tokens in, into the pool. And some people think that, okay, I just want to get the token to the, the, the trade. And so what they get is that because you put it, you have the incentive to put it. So some people, when they do the swap, usually 3% of the, 
of their total swapped amount of money will go back to you. So you have the incentive to put your money into the pool. So whenever the people do the swap, their transaction fee, nearly 3%, will go to you. So you are, you are making the money from it. So that is why it's very blockchain kind of idea is that sharing economy. Why is it sharing economy? Then everyone can be a market maker and make profit from the transaction fee. So since, you know, like if you ever trade a stock, you know, like in this world, not so many people can really be a market maker. Citadel Security can be a market maker. But they are billions dollar kind of a company. You cannot make money from the transaction fee. Okay. But now with AMM or this decentralized world, you can make the trans transaction fee. So this is really the beauty. Everyone can be a market maker. Traditionally, if you want to be a market maker, you need to have a huge amount of money, like Citadel Security, you have a big company, no entrance for you and me, but now the world is different. So I have a question, right? So we're talking here about the incentives of different market participants, right? Yeah. Uh, obviously, what's new here is that you know, market maker, that's traditionally the stock exchange. It's the one getting fees for every yeah. transaction. So now people can get fees, but then there is still, of course, the traditional incentive to trade, to speculate on prices yeah, moving exactly. up and down, right? Exactly. So I'm just curious, uh, uh, like how is there a concept of like a derivative contract or something that speculates on a future price? Like how is that handled under the smart contract? Oh yeah, so first of all, you can buy it, right? So if you bid ETH, and this is just like a US dollar, if you bid ETH price will go up, so you can swap your US dollar to ETH. And if you believe ETH will go down, you'll sell your ETH and go into US dollar. So you can do that. And we'll talk about it a little bit later, just to bear me with a few slides and we'll answer your question. This is exactly the research I'm going to do. So the Uniswap actually is the biggest swap on this one. It's only, it's only a peer like in 2020, now it's like a, it's a few billion dollars. I think maybe, you know, 10 billion dollar companies, only two years, that's, you know, like a, and surprisingly, I know the Uniswap founder, actually, he's, he's a, you know, kind of a mechanical engineer person. He has no, no programming skills. He just learned the programming, write it. He never become, in fact, this thing become big. And it's just crazy. Okay. So you can see, now I think I swap like 30 ETH and die is the US dollar. So you do the swap. And so it's just a very simple, you know, like screen. So you just do, do it. And you select them. And you can contribute the money. So you can add the liquidity into ETH and die. And you want, you know, as 3%, sorry, 0.3% of fee will give to you whenever the people make the swap. And you will deposit it into it. But actually, it's a slightly more complicated. I haven't told you that. You know, this is called the unit swap. It's providing another feature that instead of like saying, whenever the people swap, you can get the money, you can determine a price range. I can say, okay, I see when the ETH price is between $726 and $2,900. $2,900. I can see, okay, I only want to get the, you know, I only want to deposit my, my money and earn the transaction fee when the transaction, when, when the swap price is between this range. So this is called concentrated liquidity. You'll make a, you'll make a more like an accurate prediction of price. So you get a higher kind of transaction fee. Yeah, because many people have their money in the pool. Traditional is a uniform, but you can make the prediction of the price and then you get more fees from that. So you're saying there's an incentive for the market to uh, behave in an orderly fashion. Uh, and it's, at least I'm not so familiar with the traditional yeah. like finance concept, but there's a concept of an orderly yeah. market yeah. where the stock exchange prevents you from posting too high or too low exactly. prices, right? So this is supposed to encourage orderly behavior in the market. Yeah, exactly. This is more like making you sure, like you can predict the very accurate price so that you will get like the transaction. Whenever the transaction happening in this range, you will get transaction fee. Well, outside of that, you won't get any. Right, and basically it's to encourage you to not post stupidly high exactly. stupid prices. Exactly. Okay, so this is called concentrated liquidity. I'm not going to that. So for example, you know, liquidity provider, traditionally, they can put $50 of USDC in another stable coin and $50 of ETH uh, from E2 into the customer range. But now they can allocate this into like this kind of range. And then, you know, like, and maybe another five hundred dollars into a different range. They can be very, you know, they can you can have to complicate things, things, things all that. Uh, so this is a paper. If you're interested, you can look at this. But actually, the students, uh, he's he is very amazing. Actually, he is. I, I worked with him at uh, twenty twenty. You know, like sixty five years. He said, okay, professor, I just want to do some business by myself. And he he he, he borrowed like fifty million dollars, uh, create a fund to trading on EMM, and he earned like ten million dollars, even higher than that. And he said, okay, I'm back to doing some research. 
And this paper is tell you that I won't go into details of that, but it's actually going back to Chiron's question. The problem that you put your money into it, the liquidity provider, you can think about, you know, you earn a transaction fee, but do you have any risk? You have one risk. If you are like a JP Morgan or a big company, your, your, your problem is that you put your money into it, you earn a transaction fee, that's great. But if the ETH price drops significantly, as a liquidity provider, you cannot, you, you cannot make the, you put it in, into it, you want to earn a transaction fee. So you cannot get rid of, you cannot get out of the pool. You have to keep your money inside the pool. It's like a treasure, it's like a box. You have to put your money in. But if you see this year, ETH price jumps from like $6,000 to $2,000, you have to bear your loss. This is what you already call it impermanent loss in the finance. So the thing that what we did is that we helped the, you know, like the people say, okay, you can create a kind of an option strategy to hedge against the risk, like your ETH just the price drops down. So this is a, so this is on the Uniswap V3, you know, like the, you know, for example, this is a Bitcoin. This is a price of Bitcoin versus the US dollar. And this is your profit and a loss. If you put your money in the liquidity pool, we can draw like, like, like a picture like that. And we'll design like a portfolio of options actually using machine learning to have another way. And when we combine them together, so you see that it's very small, it's only 0.05%. So you, you see that we still cannot hedge against everything. It's, on the, it's a real data, but we can hedge significantly. So which means that you put your money in it, this skill is very small, it's only 0.05. That's a different skill, this is 600, you know, like this is a, but this is only 0.05, it's almost a hedge. So which means that, you know, you are, if you are a big banker, you put your money in it, you, you, you are not exposure to the risk, the market risk, you only earn the transaction. So if you are spectacular, you, you know, if, if you are thinking, oh, I only want to make a big money, this strategy is not, is not for you, but you know, for some people, it's just say, I want to buy some Bitcoin and ETH, I just want to put there, I just want to make, make, make a little bit transaction fee. But, but actually, if you, your money is large enough, the transaction fee is pretty significant. Uh, so just just trying to understand what I'm saying. So this is actually your your you're basically putting into orders into the yeah. system, right? Yeah. Uh, one of uh, and the just trying to understand. Um, so okay, so the smart contract is basically the program that's running the market, right? Yeah. Then uh, how technology technically what is what is an order on on this, right? How 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 is that? actually interact with the blockchain itself. This is just something I've been curious about. Oh yeah, this, you mean like, this is just a, we, we can't run this. Uh, this AMM is just around the blockchain because uh, mm -hmm. this swap, you can, you know, the people in the, the, the because it's the story is that because the blockchain cannot maintain this limit of the structure. Right. So the other people using blockchain to the decentralized finance using this way. Okay, so everyone's uh, order is in the form of a smart Exactly, contract. every order, every liquidity pool is in the, in the, so actually if you say you want to deposit in the money, like say 100 ETH in the pool, the, this equation will help you convert some ETH in, into DAI to make sure that their product will be a constant. And then you contribute to the liquidity. <clears throat> when people, people make the swap, you earn the transaction. Uh -huh. yeah. But you are, you are putting your money there, you are, you are exposed to the risk. If your ETH price, it just drops significantly. Then what's so, the mechanism for someone to, uh, okay, so you're making transaction fees in return for providing yeah. liquidity, right? Uh, and then uh, how, how do people uh, get out and what are the penalties for, for like getting out? Can you, can you reverse this in any sense? So you can like, get your money out. You can get your money out, right? Okay. And your money out, you'll be, re you can't say, okay, you put the money in the ETH and die. You, but but you're like, for example, initially you put some money like ETH and that is three, you know, like three. Oh, I see. You, you get out whatever swaps yeah. have taken place. Yeah. So if you started with say 100% ETH yeah. and some swaps happen, yeah. what you will pull out is some ETH combination of that, right? Exactly. You cannot control that. You that's cannot control that. This is, yeah, this that's where your risk comes from. Yeah, that's where your risk comes from. Yes, exactly. Okay, finally, I only have five minutes, but I want to tell you like one thing is really, really interesting, just very quickly, a uh, few slides. Uh, you know, we talk about this size as one of the stable coin. What is stable coin? Stable coin is something packed to the US dollar. So one cryptocurrency exactly matched like US dollar. How much stable coin in the, in the circulation? 100, $155 billion in the circulation. Okay, so, so you, you, most of the government think that, okay, you should, what do you do stable coin? It's very easy. You buy a lot of bond, like US dollar bond. Okay. And because you assume the bond, the US dollar is very, it's very stable. So it's a, as a collateralization. Okay. 
and you put your, your US bond as a treasure, you shouldn't move it, and then you release the stable coin. So when the people like sell their stable coin, actually you, are, you, you, you make sure like your, the, the things works on because you have this large characterization. Okay. Then some people like very, you know, surprisingly one genius kind of master from Stanford University, he asked a question, can I make this perpetual machine? Without any characterization, can I design a stable coin? And also they, they can, they, they, they did that for okay. They have two, two coins, one is called UST, which is one is, is, is packed to the US dollar and the other called the Terra, or Luna, it's a different coin. So what they did is very interesting, okay? It's very simple, I just tell you one side, then you can imagine the other side. So USD should be like $1, and Terra is the coin, they, they can just control you. It, it can be whatever price they can, you know, like they can put the, the, the supply of the Terra and the trade on the market. So let's assume the US dollar, this is USD, USD is like below $1, let's say $0.9. Okay, it's called BPAP. People don't like that because it's no longer stable. So what they did is that now you can sell $0.9, this one USD, sell this one USD dollar to the system, and the system will destroy this token, but they will reward you one worth, like $1 worth of tarot coin. But people will do that, right? So it's an charge, you make this, and you earn the $0.1. So, but you know, eventually this will go up because if you, give back this one token to the system, the system will destroy it, you are called burnt. When you burn it, your supply will be smaller. You know, the money is about supply and demand, the smaller and smaller, so this guy will gradually go into one dollar. Very genius system, go. I have a question, so how does the system know the price of UST? Like, do you use an oracle, or is there a way for- uh, There is an oracle, but they, you also can just look at their price on the Binance or- So you have to trust like a yeah. third party to tell you yeah, yeah, Exactly, but they use some oracles as well. I think they use some oracles as well. Okay. okay. Uh, very simple, okay? Now let's look what happened. <laughs> two years, two years, you know, like the, the stable coin UFT, the market, uh, people, you know, the total number of tokens the market of using is $41 billion. Only one week this year. Actually, I didn't mark market, it's May, about May 6th. The price of UFT from $1 dropped to zero. Now it's still zero. Okay, and what happened? Uh, I, I was, be quickly, some people will just withdraw the money from the curve. The curve is another swap pool. And then, you know, like the, then the people really worry about this and do a lot of sales. But the idea is very simple, actually. When you depend a lot, then why the system doesn't work? The thing that it will give you one dollar. But people know like these two coins are like connected. And then the price of tarot also drops as well. And traditionally, one dollar, I just give you one coin, maybe like that, or like maybe at that time, Terra is very expensive, one hundred dollars for Terra. So they just give you zero point zero one. But suddenly, because people lose the face, people all sell it. The Terra price jumps to like let's say zero point zero 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 one. And when you like redeem one dollar, I need to give you millions of tokens. And because I need to give you this many of tokens, I need to generate more tokens because I only have this many of tokens in circulation. But if I generate more tokens, this price will certainly go up, like go down, and the whole system just a crash. So it was a, like some perpetual trading deflationary loop. It exactly. deflated itself because the response of the system was to increase the supply. Of exactly. Tokens. If you have price rise, if this is a US dollar, you don't worry about that. Right. Because I give you the US dollar, this is still like worth this amount of money, but it's, a, it's another token. So basically it was, old, it was not stable under extreme events. Exactly. Exactly. So you can see like this is the market cap of thing. It's that just a Luna, the USD. This is the you know the market cap of USD. This is the market cap of Luna. And this is a collapse all together. So like, just crap all together. So theoretically, I raise this question. I know it's a very hard question. I'm thinking about this. Um, it's a very theoretical question, saying that can we prove an information theoretical impossibility result showing that algorithm makes stable coin without characterization is unstable. So which means that you are impossible to design a, no matter how complicated your mechanism is, you are impossible to design a stable coin without characterization. If that is possible, then we have, it's very interesting, we can build a model quantifying the stability score based on the characterization ratio and many other factors. For example, the volatility of the ETH or Bitcoin. I have to tell you, you know, like uh, there's one student, the undergraduate students, uh, I think his, their par his parents are doing the, you know, kind of a business of the trading business over many countries. 
So he has uh, this idea. He talked to me. Say, how about I get you say you get characterization from the U.S. government, U.S. bond, but it's very hard. You know? How about I get characterization from like others, you know, like different countries. For example, some country from Africa, some country from Latin America, and I use this bond as characterization. I really a stable coin. But it's possible. You know, that them, I, I tell them I don't see any theory. It's it's very risky business. But you know, like if you have a stability score, because this volatility of this bond, you can have the historical data is very rich. If we can translate the volatility into like how much kind of characterization you need, probably, for example, for the US dollar, if I want to release one million dollar stable coin, I can just buy like one million dollar of bond or slightly more than that. But probably I can, there should be a theorem tell you like if you want to release like one million dollar stable coin back to the US dollar, how much kind of a bond you need to buy from different countries given their historical volatility? Right. So you're saying you're saying that basically, the, if you want to collateralize, the collateral itself must not be volatile. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so I don't know. So it's a whole new area. It's not not almost no papers in this field. No like established framework. But it's just a, you know, it's just a, so many open problems to think about. I wonder if there are like parallel problems in like traditional finance when like say a, co a country releases like a new currency and tries to peg it to another currency. I wonder if there's like research over there that could be- I don't see there. anything. Yeah, to be honest, I don't see anything. Good question. Seems I, like a, I, 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 on the other hand, I have to confess, I'm not a finance professor. So, so maybe there's some literature I'm missing, but uh, I don't see. So, Okay, so I think uh, I'm, time is up. I'm finished right on time. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, and uh, now Philip, do we still actually have a few minutes uh, left to go or do we need to end on time? Uh, no, you're welcome to ask questions. Great. Well, then as is tradition, uh, let's open up a few minutes uh, for anyone to ask questions on either part of Sichuan's talk, uh, be it the, you know, the digital privacy part or the uh, part about uh, Web3 and blockchain. Um, so, and I think with that, um, Philip, do you know if anyone on the uh, attendee, remote attendee list is asking questions? Um, no, there are no questions on the chat and nobody's raised their hand. Okay, so no questions for our, for our remote attendees. Uh, any questions from the uh, folks in the room? So, uh, oh. Yes, uh, I have no idea about the uh, Web3 and uh, blockchain, but I want to know that uh, it's pretty convenient. That's, uh, for example, US dollars are connected with the uh, oils. They are trusting each other. But for this, I just see that money goes back, money goes in, but I didn't see any practical means. Oh, the practical means that uh, just thinking about you are in, you know, like you are in, in a country, no means that you can get US dollar. US dollar in most of the countries, like in Africa or in many countries, you you have no way to, to, to get US dollar. Uh, you know, like you, I think you know, like I, I'm not sure. But it's my first time in the UAE, but you know, we have been living in like say US for so long. I've been living in US for 16 years. Initially, I don't I, I don't think oh, I look at this first time. I'm also wondering why it's useful. If I, if you talk to my you know some people like for example in the pandemic, the people in the in the in the US they told me that for some countries. When they want to get their money, send their money to their home, you know, 30 percent of charge, 30 percent, even higher than that. So in most of the country, you're accessible, and you're not accessible to the to the U.S. dollar. So for that country, the adoption of the cryptocurrency maybe is is I, I don't know about regulation perspective, but, uh, but 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 it's high because you know like many countries, many places. The, the financial development is not as, you know, like a... So I have a question, see, and this is about uh, the kind of the long-term like interaction between machine learning and, and Web3, right? So the impression I'm getting right now from uh, your lecture, but also my general understanding of Web3 is that a lot of the uh, economic principles yeah. as it were. Uh, for example, in classical finance, we have hundreds of years of economic research yeah. and the models exist. And because of the models, 
uh, we, we understand what the predictive problems yeah. are. And this is where machine learning, you know, especially in the first part of your talk, you said, at the end of the day, you're trying to predict a price, but your feature map can be arbitrarily complicated. Yeah. with this gigantic deep learning model yeah. if you want that, right? Yeah. And this is how ML starts to plug into like domain specific problems, whether that's in finance or natural sciences, uh, any field you can name, right? So I'm wondering at what point do you see this plug-in opportunity uh, in Web3, right? I, I feel that maybe there must be some level of economic modeling, uh, the, the fundamental models uh, and, and you know, principles must yeah. be derived first before the predicted problems can happen. Exactly. But when do you forecast, when do you forecast this to happen? I think it will happen not at all at once, it's gradually. Uh, first of all, Michael Jordan has done amazing research in connecting machine learning and economics. I think yes, some of the right. part of this research, research will have a big impact in the, especially in the blockchain world in the future. Uh, but there are indeed a lot of like machine learning problems that I, I, I bet, I don't see any paper, I'm working with some machine learning scientists on this, uh, but I bet there are hundreds of machine learning scientists in all, are all like crypto fund trading firm asking this question. Yes. You know, when you put the liquidity in pool, mm -hmm. you select these two things, mm -hmm. what should be the right range? If your range can be very accurate and the big swap, for example, incentive, right. happens along, like for example, you, you play this to be $700 and $702, and there's a big swap just inside this range, mm -hmm. then you get most of the transaction fees. And this can make you that. So, so make accurately making a prediction of a range mm -hmm. is become very valuable. But traditionally, you know, like making a range, that's something very interesting to like stock trading. You want to get a price and you say, okay, you buy or not buy. But here you directly predict the rate and try to, okay, you, you just predict, you know, like there, there will be like, a, you know, kind of a more like transaction will be happening in certain range. Then that can make you a huge amount of money. So like the trading logic or like that, we, we, we already in finance, we're trying to say we find alpha. But alpha in the crypto world is very different from traditional market. So some company like Tor Research and a few others, when they catch this earlier on, like in 2020, they make you know billions of dollars directly from that. Right. So you say algorithmic trading is one application where exactly. ML has been used in the traditional yeah. finance world, and yeah. there's still opportunities within. Oh, the very, market. very a lot of new opportunity, and also for example, traditional people using the machine learning for money laundering, but money is not happen that frequently in the. In that, that, but this will be different. So you think about this, I always, you know, like you think about this amazing thing that in 2008, you know, uh, at that time, the Lehman brother bankrupted. There's a financial crisis. There's a, all the finance and economics professor writing paper trying to explain why it happened. But this is all like conjectures. They're all building model based on their mind because they never know the transaction between Lehman brother and Fed and JP Morgan and BlackRock, Water Ridge. City bank, so on and so forth. This is it's a chain. It's usually call it financial contingent. Yes. But now the blockchain, the amazing thing is that every transaction you make is online. I see. When so you do the swap, your information recorded, and it's never no one can hide it. It's immutable. It's on chain forever. So, so you know the like perfect information. Exactly. Information so it's the asking you: Can you do all the traditional finance with the one hundred percent of transparent of the money flow? Totally new problem. No one knows how to do that. All right. We have time for maybe one more question. Uh, anyone would like to ask? And Philip, just checking one more time. Any questions from our online participants? No. Perfect. Okay, well, if that's the case, uh, this is the end of today's CI AI Colloquium. Let's you know, give our speaker one more round of applause.